The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, they, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they, are, they had argued with one another, Who was the greatest? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm going to keep my floppy Bible near me just to make sure I've got all the stuff in Mark in front of me. And we come to another one of these Mark and teachings that is hard to hear. Mark is famous for this, and as we go through Mark, we get to meet a number of people on the way, and one of the groups of people that we get to know are the Twelve, and other people we get to know have no name. And it's interesting in the Gospel of Mark that the people with no name are often more faithful than the Twelve. In fact, if you look at the whole history of the Twelve in the Gospel of Mark, they don't come out so well. They come out worse in Mark than even Matthew or Luke. And, you know, there's an affection in the Gospel of John for the beloved disciple, but that's about it. Everybody else in the, the, the Twelve is problematic. From Peter, who denies Jesus three times at the time he needs him most, all the way down to Judas who betrayed him, and everybody in between ran away. So we're not looking at the most stalwart group of individuals. And yet, the gospel keeps walking with them. It's, I find it also interesting that there is a tradition that the gospel of Mark was written by a, a, a man called John Mark, who was a relative of Peter. So if this is what your relatives are writing about you, uh, wow, who needs, who needs an apologist? Anyway... In this morning's gospel, we're sort of continuing where we left off last week. So last week, Jesus did start this teaching about the fact that he must suffer and die and rise again. And when we hear that, and imagine yourself, you're, you're one of the twelve, and you've hooked up with Jesus thinking he's something special. And by the way, all of the twelve grew up in this world, not some other world. They grew up in this world, even though it was you know, first century Palestine, they are very human in many aspects, and we haven't changed all that much. And so the world that the disciples grew up in, everyone knew that what you wanted was power and authority. And that's what they were hoping for the Messiah, the Messiah being a new king. Um, there are some translations that in saying, instead of saying the Christ or Messiah, even put king in there in certain places because this is who the, the disciples were following. They weren't following the Jesus we know. They were following a person they thought was going to go to Jerusalem, turn everything over on its side, and put in place of a Roman governor and Herod and all of the mess there, a new David on the throne. And the Gospel of Mark spends its whole time trying to turn that concept of who Jesus is as King and Messiah on its head. It's doing a new cultural thing. The cultural thing for us is power is good and you can use it 
to tell people what to do. I find it interesting. I've lived most of my life around two major cities in the United States of America. Actually, there's a third one that I can throw in there, but it's not nearly as cool as the other two. By the way, Chicago is a major U.S. city that's a lot humbler than others, and New York is not, and Washington, D.C. sometimes is not either. And so if you're living in the cultural milieu of those two cities, Washington, D.C., where I've been living for six years now, and right outside of New York or in Manhattan, you know the rules. The rules are this. More money, more power, more authority is good. That's, that's the rule. That's what everybody lives and abides by, largely speaking. It may not be entirely true, but that's the way the culture is set up. In New York, you have people fighting over who's going to be the biggest advertiser or who's going to have the big, most money in a financial institution. And you get to Washington, D.C., and you have... 100 presidents sitting in the Senate, and you have another 435 sitting in the House of Representatives, and then you have all the cabinet officials, and then there is the president and the vice it, you get the You get the point. And everybody wants to be in that Oval Office, or at least think they want to be in that Oval Office. And still, even when they say they want to do good, the way to do good is to get more power. And then power in and of itself becomes a problem. And Jesus is sitting there with his disciples in Capernaum, the place where he hangs out the most in the Gospel of Mark. And he's in a house, and after having taught this lesson now twice, emphatically, that he's got to go to the cross, his disciples have been arguing about the fact that who gets to be the biggest disciple. It's the same old latter thing well, if I get to be nearer to Jesus, then I'm going to get more authority. And they're arguing among themselves over this, and Jesus knows it. I don't know how he knew it. You know, by the way, you know, it doesn't take prescience to be able to do this. If you've been in a crowd of people, I am sure you've heard people saying, oh, I'm bigger. And by the way, I'm going to admit this. When it's men, we're trying to hit the pecking order, uh, you know, big time, because we're trying to figure out which man gets the most women, I'm sorry, that's sociological, it's anthropological, and that's what these guys are doing, right? Who's going to be most important? Who's going to have the most power? And who gets to lord it over the most people? And then Jesus does this really incredibly and stunning thing. He grabs a child and pulls it to himself. You notice the child is neither he or she, it's an it. That's one of those quirky things about Greek Children don't have genders, they are its in Greek. I don't know what age they get to be non-children, but that's what it says. And the other thing it says is the word, there's a special word for this in Greek, that is used not only for little children, but for slaves. It tells you where children sit in the authority of the free class of people, their slave level. They have no power, no authority. This is not childhood in 21st century United States of America, which even though we don't have a lot of legal power, there's a lot that's done for children. And if you live in a lot of stable homes in, in you know, the middle to upper middle class, life is not that bad to be a child. You have food, you have clothing, you have a house over your head, I mean a roof over your head, and you have some comfort in this place, in this time, Hunger was still a possibility. Having no clothing was a possibility. Not being housed was a possibility. And if you're in that class of people, to be a child in that class was really, really frightening. And so Jesus pulls this child to himself, and in order to emphasize to the disciples what he wants from them, the twelve, I should say, what he wants from them, he puts this child there and says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Think about that. If you welcome a slave, a child with no power, you are welcoming me. And whoever welcomes me, whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent to me. So this is going all the way to God. Transitive property, if you welcome that child. If you serve that child, if you nurture that child, if you care for that child, 
you're welcoming God into your lives. Now, this is not the normal sense of power, certainly in first century Palestine. And even today where we have, you know, social uh, uh, nets to help people in trouble, we're doing it less, I think, often for the real value of the child than to make ourselves feel less bad about what kind of people we are. The Gospel of Mark serves as a discipleship gospel. There was an ancient community, I've told you this story before, who used it, reading it as their catechism for teaching their baptismal candidates how to be. And Jesus is the primary disciple in this particular gospel. No other disciple, yes, some of the unnamed, the Syrophoenician woman from last week, the, the unnamed uh, leader of a synagogue, uh, the, the, the man in the tombs who was only called by the name of the demons that possessed him, they were faithful. And their lives are dramatically changed by their faith. And he, Jesus is the one who keeps on keeping on, and the twelve, not so much. I had a wise man once tell me, if you're looking at the Gospels and you're trying to figure out who you are in the Gospel, by the way, this is like watching The Office. If you're trying to figure out who you are in The Office, you're Michael. That's why I couldn't watch The Office very often. Um, the same thing is true here. We're, if you're trying to figure out who you are, you're the 12. We don't get it. Because the sayings are hard and they run counter to what we're expecting. So I told the group at 8, I'm reading a book that i finally gotten around to reading. It's an adventure story. It's Alexander Dumas. It's the man in the iron mask. And the story is not like the movies. Any of the movies. Because in the movies, the good guys come out and they're in great shape. A little damage, maybe, but largely speaking, they win. In the book, shh, I'm sorry if it's a spoiler alert. It's 150 years old, so if you haven't gotten around to it, I, I apologize. But I found it really hard as I've gone through this book to get it into my head that this is not going to be the Hollywood happy ending that I get, and I hate it. And I keep screaming at the, at the, at the, at the musketeers, don't do that, because I know what's going to happen. The same thing is here for, for us in place of the twelve. Jesus is telling us what's important and what's, what we should be on the lookout for, and we keep going, this doesn't work. And it doesn't. And yet, when Jesus teaches about this kind of way of being, he's teaching about the kingdom of heaven. This is what it's going to be like in the kingdom of heaven, that the powerless will be tended to and loved and cared for. And those people who aren't important are going to be tended to and loved and cared for. And the people who've been powerful and cared for well, they've got a different thing going on, and they may have to compensate. But Jesus is trying to train his own twelve, the ones who will follow after him, to live in this way. The fact that we even have the stories, as bad as the twelve end up looking, is because they finally got it. It just takes them till after the end of the gospel to put it together. So, what about us? What about communities like St. Francis? What about church communities when we're no longer the center of the universe and part of the core of our cultural narrative any longer? Well, folks, it means we have an opportunity to do the Jesus thing. The Jesus thing is to look at who are the children among us and serve them. We're the slaves among us, serve them, but not simply to fix them or to go along with them and try to make their lives great, but to walk with them so they know they're cared for and loved and ministered to. As the churches face the challenges of a new and very unusual 
culture that we're walking in, I think we already have a guidebook for this. It's the culture that Jesus was walking into with his own people. He doesn't set them up to follow the culture of Rome or Herod or anybody else. He sets them up to follow the kingdom of God, to have discipleship to him, meaning discipleship to God, and to serve those whom God sends them. We don't have a job to fix the world or to be the authority or be the powerful. Our job is to serve the child and the slave among us.